A few years ago, a United States submarine sank off the coast of New England. The rescue operation led to the discovery of the disabled vessel in the bottom of the ocean. And when the divers approached the submarine, they heard a tapping sound from the inside. And when they stopped to listen, they heard this message tapped in Morse code. Is there hope? Hmm. That is the question still tapped from within the depths of the human heart. In the hour of tragedy and of impending death, it's most poignant. But hope is never a luxury that we can get along without. It's an absolute necessity if we are to have a zest for life. Hope is faith in the future, faith that gives courage and strength to face the present. Young people usually are full of hope. The future lies ahead of them and they set their sights on it. But some of us in the winter of our lives tend to become discouraged because we have nothing to look forward to. The present is unbearable because there is no future and they have only memories of the past to sustain them. Such a state of mind is nothing less than the words brought to mind by Dante, abandon hope, all you that enter here. It's a scientific fact that hopelessness shortens life. For a man without hope feels himself cornered and trapped and loses the will to live. Science itself, according to Dr. Carl Menninger, is built on hope. Man can't help hoping, he says. A scientist only hopes more accurately. And today we're hoping for a cure of not only cancer, but a vaccine for this uh, pandemic. And that's why men are working hard, men of science are working hard in their laboratories to make this hope come true. In the meantime, patients ask, is there hope? And even if a way is found to lengthen the span of life, there is still a boundary which no human hopes can cross. That boundary is the inevitable death that awaits all of us. And if one is hopeless in facing death, then one is also hopeless in facing life. The good news of the advent gives the answer to our question. Yes, there is hope. The men in the sunken submarine were utterly unable to cope with their tragic situation. Their only hope was rescue coming from the outside. That says the message of the advent is precisely the situation of all mankind. Trapped by the powers of evil and of death, we are helpless and doomed, but there is hope for rescue has come from the outside. Hark the glad sound, the savior comes. The apostle Paul proclaims this message loud and clear. And again, he uses the word hope again and again. He concludes on this high note. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope. If you look at some of the scriptures, the Revised Standard Translation says abound in hope. The Phillips says radiant with hope. The New English Bible says overflowing with hope. What is the source of this radiant and overflowing hope? The apostle gives the threefold answer. First, he says, the word of God by encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And listening to the medley of conflicting voices in the world, especially today, we become discouraged. Encouragement comes when we hear the voice of God speaking to us in the Holy Scriptures. The apostle quotes the prophets who spoke of God's promise to discouraged Israel. In the gloomy night of distress and defeat, they kept the candle of hope burning. Take heart, they said, 
for the Messiah is coming. He will establish his kingdom of everlasting righteousness and of peace. The New Testament announces that the promise has been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. Prepare to receive him. It is the Bible that brings us this word of hope. As Luther says in his picturesque way, the Bible is the lowly donkey which brings the Advent King into the Jerusalem of our hearts. The center of the Bible and the center of our hope is indeed the Advent King, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the second and basic emphasis Quoting Isaiah, the apostle says that the root of Jesse shall come. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Jesus is not only the Jewish Messiah. He is the hope of all nations. He is the savior of all men. And he brings the rescue from outside ourselves. He delivers us from sin and from death and despair. He gives us the joy and the peace of God's children. And he enables us to live as God's children. And how does he do it? He does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us faith so that we are radiant with hope no matter what situation we must face. This is the apostle's third emphasis. Christ is not only a historical figure, but the indwelling Christ, who through his spirit lives in the heart of the believer and empowers him to surmount all obstacles. The last enemy to be overcome is death. And our hope in facing death does not lie in our power to defy it, but in God's power to raise us from it. Death is real. And we do not have an inherent capacity to leap over the grave into another existence. But what happened on the first Easter is the ground for our hope of what will happen in the end when all of God's creation will have its Easter. Our individual existence, like the existence of mankind and of the universe as a whole, is abounded by death. And against this boundary wall, all earthborn, birth, earthborn helps, <laughs> hopes dash themselves in pieces. But our Christian hope gives us the assurance that the power which once broke through the rock hewn tomb in Joseph's garden, the power by which the church lives, will destroy even this barrier. And this power is the Holy Spirit. In Romans, we read, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit, which dwells in you. In the eighth chapter of Romans, where Christians are given this promise, Paul portrays the vastness of Christian hope. He describes Christmas and or he describes Christians as being sustained in the midst of the suffering of the present time by the expectancy of the glory to be revealed. But he goes on to portray the whole world as standing on tiptoe, waiting with eager longing for the unfolding of God's purpose in history. In another image, he compares all of creation to a woman writhing and groaning in labor pains, anxious for the appearance of new life of the future. The message of hope centers on the fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose in Jesus Christ. There's an art gallery in London and there's a picture hanging there that's titled Hope. And it presents a beautiful maiden that's seated on a globe. She is blindfolded and in her hand she holds a harp of which all the strings but one are broken. The blindfolded girl is touching the one string with her hand, 
and her head is bent toward it, earnestly waiting to catch the note of that one string. All of the strings on which we play the melody of life are indeed destined to break health, peace, security, and finally, even life itself. There remains only one string, Jesus Christ, our hope. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gospel proclaims the fulfillment of messianic hope. For in Christ, the kingdom of God has already come. But it also points to its full consummation in the future. The death and the resurrection of Christ have ushered in a new age. And the power of the Messiah live here and now by the power of the world to come. And yet we look forward to the second coming of our Lord when the inevitable consequences of the victory he has already won will become fully manifest. Our Christian hope thus has the double aspect of already and not yet, or I have come, or I shall come again. The kingdom of God as a present reality is the key to the Christian interpretation of history and the ground of Christian hope for the world. The risen and glorified Christ is the Lord of history and the determiner of destiny. The hope of the world lies in the mighty power by which he conquered death and which he releases into the world through his church. The kingdoms of the world, however, will not be gradually transformed into the kingdom of Christ. As our Lord expresses it, the world is like a, wheat, a field in which wheat and, grow, and weeds grow side by side. We studied that earlier this year in the, in the parables. The weeds are not changed into wheat, but both mature until the harvest. Good gets better and evil gets worse. The final scene in the drama of history is not a utopia, but a climactic clash between Christ and the Antichrist. It would be wrong, however, to focus attention on the anti-Christian aspects alone and to regard with suspicion Christian efforts towards a better world. Since the future belongs to Christ, the Christian attitude towards the world is not despair, but it is hope. It is confident consecration to the test implied in the prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before its final consummation, the Advent hope looks beyond history to the fulfillment of Christ's promise of his return in glory. The ultimate triumph of Christ is based upon the victory achieved by his resurrection. One of the great theologians of our century describes this in a dramatic way. High above an alpine valley are towering mountains bearing a tremendous mass of snow. A gunshot or some other vibration of, of sound is sufficient to set in motion an avalanche which rolls into the valley, burying everything that it meets. Before the avalanche, the enormous energy contained in the mass of snow, capable of annihilating entire villages, is potential rather than actual. And in the same way, the power of Christ's resurrection, which is sufficient to change the world, and annihilate all of the enemies of God hangs over the world until the sound of the last trumpet releases that avalanche. The full power is there, but it's being held back. The result is the breathless tension of which the apostle speaks. Viewed from eternity, Cal Calvary and the second coming occupy but a single moment. They are two aspects of the same divine act. The atonement and the new creation 
belong as inseparably, inseparably together as lightning and the thunder which follows it. Lightning and thunder are the effects of the same eruption of electricity. There's an interval between them only because sound waves travel more slowly than light waves. But once the lightning has flashed, the sound of thunder must come. And in the perspective of eternity, we are living in that interval between the flash of lightning and the sound of thunder. With the eyes of faith, we see the victorious Lordship of Christ. And when the thunder of judgment sounds, the whole world will experience it. And it is on this ground that we affirm with assurance, he shall come again with glory. The faith is not based upon speculation of what we do not know, but on affirmation of what we most surely know. The victory which Christ has already won and the certainty of the ultimate consummation of that victory. As we open the season of Advent and we look forward to the coming celebration and remembrance of Christ's birth, we're also filled with this affirmation and we look forward through all of the things that challenge us in this world whether it be war or famine or, or even politics, which we found out. We look forward to that uh, experience. We look forward to that affirmation that we might find that joy, that it might bring peace and succor to our minds and our hearts, that we might live steadfastly and even triumphantly the life and the mission that Jesus Christ has shared with us with the expectation that eventually he will come and he will remove all of those things which challenge our existence. And so as we enter this season of Advent, may we find our hearts full of that affirmation and that expectation but above all, might we fill our, find our hearts filled with hope is my prayer. Amen.